What you're about to experience is one man's quest to see beyond the tumultuous period we're in and to envision what lies just beyond our grasp, yet well within our reach. Welcome to Larry Rifkin's America Trends, where the future has arrived, and it's just in time. With us today on our program is Al Gorithum. Hi, Al. How are you? <laughs> or shall we say, we are here with Mike Raffone. Yeah, there you go. You Mike Raffone. Yeah. <laughs> or shall we say that we actually just exercised with Gymnasium? <laughs> can we use all of these horrible jokes from our sure radio we past? Sure, we can. Sure. Right. Why not? Might as well. Well, no, we're talking about <laughs> algorithms on America Trends today. I'm Larry Rifkin, along with John Krofsick. And we had a conversation, John, we did with Dr. Edward Tenner. And he's the author of The Efficiency Paradox. Yes. Yes, this was very interesting. Now, he began a study of what he calls positive unintended consequences, especially the role of failure and resilience in technology and looking at our over-reliance on all the gadgetry today. Yeah, and how, well, I guess initially the algorithms are going to help us, but eventually... It's all going to fail. Well, right? they may betray us because we're putting too much yes. stock in them <laughs> and we're releasing our own innate intelligence. And, and we're saying, here, it's all yours. We've already lost our brains anyhow. Well, let me give you an example of this, John. <laughs> no, help me with this because in a way I have given myself up. I, I, I must admit this. One of my greatest fears in life was always when I had a business meeting and I had to get somewhere. So you have a uh. map. And you have, you know, whatever devices at that time. And so you can get from one highway to the next. But that last mile syndrome, oh, no, I'm going to run late. I don't know. I have to take a left or right, whatever it may be. Today, I plug in the GPS. You're I don't right. even think, am I going north, south, east, or west? I've given myself up to technology. Yeah. Is that a bad thing to have done? No, I think that's it's okay, but you gotta realize that sometimes it leads you wrong too. So that's what he's trying aware. to say to us: that if we give it all up to the machine, give it all up to the algorithm, we are inevitably going to be uh, disappointed in some <laughs> of the results, and we also atrophy in the things that make us human right. and make us really smart in ways that thus far. Computers haven't been programmed to be. I think television is taking care of uh, most of our brain cells at night. They're just dying off watching <laughs> most of the programs. Well, let me ask you seriously. <laughs> I mean, if we are being entertained to death, as the book by Neil Postman suggests, I mean, what have we done to ourselves? In other words, having to read a book versus watch that book adapted to television. Right. What do you think that does to us? Well, we're, we're, we're taking our imagination out of it. I mean, the books are great because you can imagine how the characters go on, and we're looking with television. Somebody else has already made up the story for us, so we're just kind of uh, loafing around watching it. Okay, know? so instead of having to read a very detailed description of an event or activity, they're, they're shortcutting the process for us. Right. They're giving us an image. And they craft around that large book with very detailed observations about human behavior. And, and we just get to dive in where we want. And they're putting their whatever their spin is on the book, which may be totally different when you read the book. You know, they, I think we're losing that. Well, we are going to explore in this podcast how in the long run, the over-reliance on some of these breakthroughs may well damage our own efficiency and some of our senses and our capabilities in the process. It's really important to do this. And again, if you're somebody who's kind of yielded <laughs> to all the technology in your life, pull it back. Yeah. Gain well, control. I've, I've even lost how to write. You know, I don't I don't write so much anymore. Well, I've and seen so your I, writing, when I John. I try to do my script. It's really? Like, what's I mean, going on here? That may be the one way <laughs> that you could have become a doctor, honestly. Well, let's get to it. The efficiency paradox. What big data 
Can't Do by Dr. Edward Tenor here on America Trends. With us on America Trends is Dr. Edward Tenor, and the book is called The Efficiency Paradox, What Big Data Can't Do. Now, Dr. Tenor, what could go wrong? We're on the verge of quantum leaps in artificial intelligence, conquering disease, becoming the Jetsons with self-driving cars. It all suggests that things are going to get a lot easier and better from here. Are you going to spoil the party? The party, I'm afraid, uh, may be spoiling itself, and I am the messenger, so I'm sorry if I have some not entirely good news, although I really do believe in artificial intelligence and the cloud and big data and all of that. Think of how many fraudulent charges we would be getting if there weren't artificial intelligence that was sorting out real from, say, uh, credit card transactions. Think of how much more spam we would be getting if there weren't artificial intelligence doing an imperfect but still invaluable job in filtering email. So I'm not at all a, uh, a pessimist, but on the other hand, I think that to use the new technology well, we really have to hold on to our common sense and skepticism, and that's the point of my book. We'll return to this episode of America Trends in just a moment. If you like what we're doing here at America Trends Podcast, please don't keep it to yourself. I know there are a lot of people, John, who think, well, if I'm listening and somebody else wants to listen at the same time, maybe we're going to collide and they're not going to be able to hear us. Is that the way the technology works? No, there's plenty of bandwidth. Everybody can listen at the same time. All right. Well, that dispels that that myth. (laughs) Now, you can do a number of things that would really be helpful to us. You could give us a kind rating or a review at Apple Podcasts, and that boosts what they consider to be our value and visibility. What does that do, John? Well, that puts us in the forefront so that you can find us easier, and most important is other people can find us easier. And you can subscribe there or on our site, americatrendspodcast.com, or wherever you're listening, so we can alert you to new episodes of the podcast, which, by the way, we put out twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Or you can like us on Facebook or follow us where, John? On Twitter. On Twitter, that's right, where the world turns to hear fake news or whatever yeah. it is. Well, Not you can us, direct we message us <laughs> at Trends Podcast <laughs> or using hashtag Trends Podcast. And you know, John, with our growing audience, and really it's been pretty remarkable, a lot of people just came to us the last month or two, and they might have missed earlier episodes. Can they get them again? They can look through them and, and uh, pick the ones they want to listen to. They're all on the website, and a lot of them are up on iTunes, many of them. All right. Well, listen, there's lots of material to listen to. We hope you have the time and will lend it to us because we try to make it worth your while. And thanks so much for listening. And tell your friends. We now return to this episode of America Trends. And when you think about it, I mean, you suggest that while we can rely on a lot of these technological breakthroughs, that if we do it to to a fairly well, it might serve us in the short term, but long term not be terribly good for us. Explain that. There are a couple of ways in, in which that happens. Uh, one of them is um, one that's become really apparent, which is that, that these techniques are really very powerful, and they may work 99 or 99.9% of the time. The problem is when they do misfire, the misfires can be catastrophic if we're not watching out because the same uh, power that can uh, take care of routine things is often uh, incapable of recognizing a a new uh, category of disaster that it hasn't experienced through programming or machine learning. Now, we've had somebody on this program, Dr. Rebecca Costa, who believes so much in predictive analytics and feels that uh, there's just about nothing we can't avoid going forward, given the information that we're going to have. Uh, How right-headed or wrong-headed do you think that is? There are good reasons for having that kind of confidence. For example, if you look at investment, the... um, the indexing and, and other predictive techniques have usually done uh, done better than, um, than the, just about all human advisors uh, it's, uh, uh, over over a long time. However, there's a problem with all of these really powerful, um, you know, powerful uh, techniques, 
And that is um, when everybody starts to use them, the results are not necessarily going to be as good as when a few people had the lead and were, uh, were, were, had, the, had the field all to themselves and the other people didn't have them. But there was an article, for example, in the Wall Street Journal recently about the changes in the game of baseball now that just about all teams are using advanced analytics. And the changes in the game have not necessarily been good for baseball in terms of attendance by younger fans, in terms of, uh, of, of income. So the problem is that, that what is really works well for one individual can have unintended consequences when it's widely adopted in society. One of the reasons for the severity of the crash in uh, 2008 was that so many people were using program trading, and each of those program traders was had a had a foolproof uh, technique. But when everybody is using them, there are all kinds of unpredictable interactions among these smart machines, and there is no master machine that's so smart that it can avoid disasters when all of these super smart programs are interacting. Now, we, I understand that if we're looking at uh, the human being and our ability to be intuitive and instinctive about many of the moves that we're going to make and not always go by the numbers or by the data that's available to us, are you more worried that we will let some of these senses and capabilities atrophy or that we'll become so over-reliant upon all of this objective information uh, that we just uh, begin not to be judgmental as human beings? beings can and trust uh, certain of their own instincts. I look to the aviation industry, which has been very advanced in using artificial intelligence and, and techniques like that. And as a result, flight safety has become much, much uh, enhanced in recent years. But every once in a while, we see there is some unpredicted event. And in that case, it takes a pilot, as we recently saw, who can uh, has the, the training and the resources to uh, take over when these automated systems are failing for whatever reason. So the same thing is true of ordinary drivers, that we have the ability to recover from all kinds of failures that automated systems might throw our way, systems, failures that, that no algorithm and no machine learning program really are able to predict completely. And if we lose our reflexes, if we lose uh, the physical presence of driving, and if we completely outsource our skills and, and let them wither, uh, then I think we're, we're taking a fairly big risk. And in fact, there is a long opinion piece in, um, in the current issue of nature on just that uh, on just that topic that, that many experts are also warning about over-reliance on self-driving systems while recognizing that these can make driving much, much safer if used in conjunction with uh, human skills and intelligence. Now, you define efficiency right at the start of your book as being able to produce goods and services with a minimum of waste. And then you go on to describe a continuous process efficiency versus a form you call platform efficiency. What's the difference between the two? Two phases of the pursuit of efficiency. One is from the early days of the Industrial Revolution in the late 18th and early 19th centuries in which people discovered ways to turn out things continuously that had previously been done only individually and small batches. For example, we have our whole printing industry dependent or almost entirely dependent on sheets of paper. Uh, when appliances are made, the uh, steel uh, comes not in sheets, but it comes in coils, and the coils are cut, and uh, machines then transform those into the shells of washing machines and, and dryers and, and so forth. So all of our industry really is based on a, a kind of assembly line process in which things are uh, continuously uh, turned out, whereas the platform is a, is a very different idea. The platform is a, a means of, of making
making transactions run with as few intermediaries as possible. Uh, what I was saying about uh, I, w- I was saying about the uh, the, the platform. Uh, the, the platform, uh, like uh, ordering through Amazon or getting a cab through Uber or Lyft or booking a room through Airbnb. All these are technologies that reduce the number of intermediaries. Uh, Bill Gates and his collaborators talked in the uh, 1990s about friction-free commerce. So it's really about reducing the, uh, the friction in buying and selling. And platform efficiency, if we gave another name to it, it reminds me of uh, the book Capitalism Without Capital. You've got all these intangible assets that are beginning to overtake tangible ones like buildings and hardware and batteries. What gets displaced in that process as you see it? Do our heads kind of get lost in the proverbial cloud? Well, one of my arguments is that because the profits, at least so far, in the uh, market for investors have been so high, at least on paper, on the um, uni- uh, unicorn companies, for example, but also on established, you know, few established companies like Amazon and Facebook, uh, it means that that investment might be drained from really harder problems in the physical and chemical sectors, for example, uh, batteries are lasting and environmentally more sound, uh, substitutes for rare earths and uh, and electronics. There are lots of really hard uh, chemical and physical questions, and those take much longer. So those become relatively less attractive for investment, and yet the cloud itself and the platform economy really also uh, depend on those. One of the examples that I give is how long it took to get from the original dry photocopying patent in uh, 1938 to the Xerox 914 machine that launched uh, over 20 years later. And yet the Xerox photocopier in a lot of ways was what launched the information age. Now, hasn't America always valued efficiency almost more than anything else? So would it be surprising that we're buying into a lot of this with such intensity? It's not surprising at all. And in the early part of my book, I give a history of the pursuit of efficiency. Efficiency was what foreign visitors were most intrigued by when they came to this country. They saw that America was rationalizing things, America was disregarding traditional job categories, uh, installing all kinds of new labor-saving machinery. And uh, one of the most interesting facts I discovered was that the uh, great Soviet industrial complexes like Magnitogorsk were actually based on the Gary, Indiana Steelworks. But while uh, the United States has moved on, uh, Russia, to a large extent, has these old-style complexes, and they've been reducing them, but it's very, very hard for them to shed them entirely because so many people's livelihoods have depended on them. And uh, nostalgia for that era is one of the forces that has made uh, Putin so popular. Many may think that uh, we fought the Civil War not only about slavery, but also about an industrial system versus an agrarian system. But you said that while people think it's basically the North trying to inflict its efficient industrial model on the South, you argue that both tried to squeeze as much profit as possible out of their systems. And, of course, one was using slave labor to do that. That's right. The studies of the plantation economy in the Deep South have shown how uh, ruthlessly efficient uh, the uh, uh, plant o- plantation owners uh, at least try to be in, in, in regimenting work, uh, installing bells and, and monitoring production. So although they consider themselves to be uh, romantic aristocrats and uh, Walter Scott heroes, in, in fact, they were, uh, they were close in... Uh, in, in spirit, in, in some ways, to the northern capitalists. 
Now, you do talk about efficiency on so many levels and look at so many different endeavors, and I really do appreciate that. As somebody who's been a gatekeeper as it relates to uh, media organizations in my career, I found it very interesting. In one chapter, you have this concern that we're going to be trying to reduce artistic expression with data showing what the masses will buy or attend, thus robbing us of cutting-edge work that breaks the rules. And you say it's really important that we have certain gatekeepers. And I think some of us understand this from a security standpoint now or a branding standpoint with all that we've seen going on with all the social media and all the irresponsible reporting that's going on from sources that we are not even aware you know, where they are coming from. But explain to us what your argument is here as it relates to the efficiency paradox. There are quite a few ways in which gatekeepers can be can be good for efficiency. Uh, one is that gatekeepers are not a monopoly or, or a guild, even though they're sometimes accused of being that, but they're really a, 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 a group of, of intensely competing people with different ideas who are always looking for the edge and are always scouting for new talent. I, I saw that in publishing. I, I was the uh, science editor of uh, Princeton University Press and that executive editor for science and history. And people think of editors as people who are sitting back and waiting for proposals for, from uh, authors and agents. But as you know, there's a lot more that goes into it. And many books are really the results of editors, not just the passive gatekeepers, but active people looking for ways to connect new ideas with the public. Many books would not have been written if some editor hadn't invited people to do them. And then, of course, once somebody has written a book, the judgment and experience of an editor, as I found myself, is really invaluable in shaping the book for the market because it's uh, like the saying about a lawyer who uh, defends himself or herself having a fool for a client. Somebody who tries to uh, to uh, uh, improve their own manuscript alone has a fool for an editor. Really what we're talking about here in many ways, I think, is the human element in all that we do and how much we retain and what appropriately we subcontract to technology and remain the species we are. I mean, that is such a delicate balance. In the end of the day, because we never asked you at the beginning to define the efficiency paradox, maybe you can put that into context for us. If there's a one short phrase I would use, it's that too much efficiency in the short run hurts efficiency in the long run. Do you want to say any more about that? Well, um, yeah. I mean, I, I, in other words, that that if we um, if we are are optimizing our behavior based on recent patterns as discovered by artificial intelligence systems, then we are foreclosing the kind of creative jumps, the kind of creative risk taking that can only come from human intuition. Uh, and sometimes it takes a while to realize the benefits of that. Uh, if there had been an accurate way to predict sales and readers' reviews, for example, Moby Dick might never have been pushed. When we look at uh, education, and you do focus on this, and obviously now, and I know you've got to be concerned about this, and you are, Dr. Tenor, by the way, he's the author of Efficiency Paradox. We spend a good bit of time in the book on this issue of education, and now we're trying to reduce everything about a kid's uh, efficiency and effectiveness in the classroom uh, to a set of numbers. And yet, even with Howard Gardner and all the work that he's done on the seven intelligences, we limit it to just a small scope in terms of learning. How difficult is it for us to imagine that we can reduce a child's potential to these numbers? I think that, that testing uh, and, and numbers definitely have a role, and I'm, I'm not at all uh, against them entirely, but the the pursuit of the numbers can take the place of uh, something that is that is even more important than than factual knowledge, which is the kind of uh, judgment and ability to learn that is really uh, the main product of an education. Many or most of us have forgotten most of what we've learned in courses, but what we remember is the 
the process of learning, the process of discovery, how we how we approach a question. This is something that's been really important for me, and I'm so glad that I had the education that I did, both in a, in a public high school and in a private university, uh, because even though I probably would fail most of the exams that I took if you gave them to me again, uh, what, what's remained is a kind of uh, a kind of judgment, and it's very hard to test for that, but people know it when they see it. And one of the things that uh, social scientists who have studied, uh, for example, NASA engineers have found is that the effect of engineering education is that very often very brilliant, very talented engineers uh, never really learn how to... One of, the, one of the results of studies of NASA engineers has been that people have not been able to speak up as well as they should to defend their technical ideas because they didn't really have the training in writing and speaking that makes people persuasive in meetings. People think that you can separate technical education from the humanities, but really, for somebody to be a, uh, a good team member and especially a good leader, they need to know how to persuade. They, they need to know not necessarily uh, quotations from Shakespeare, but they, they need to know how to uh, put um, uh, uh, feeling into their arguments or else their arguments will fall flat. And some of the uh, failures of engineering have come, uh, like the Challenger disaster, have become because people who knew the right thing really didn't have the confidence and the experience to speak up. Uh, and that can really be tragic. So I, I see uh, humanities and not as, as opposed to engineering education, but as, uh, as essential to it. And conversely, I don't think anybody is fully educated unless they understand scientific and, and engineering thinking. That's really indispensable, uh, even for people who uh, don't have uh, scientific or technical careers. Well, for those of us, and you admit that oftentimes you do it as well, we rely on GPS today. So we don't want to even look at a map. <laughs> we don't want to know where we are. We don't understand the topography. We're just saying Siri or whomever it may be, get us to where we want to go. What are we missing out as part of that? Uh, well, I've discovered myself uh, as a user of ways, uh, both its advantages and its pitfalls. I started to use Waze because I was writing in the book about problems that Waze created in diverting traffic onto residential streets, which is still an issue in many parts of the country. And I thought I should really uh, be a participant, a participant observer, if I was going to criticize. So I joined, and I really enjoyed it. I, I love using Waze. Uh, I, uh, I love the apparently meaningless progression to to one level after another, uh, so I became uh, so-called Waze royalty, and that's a lot of fun. However, I've also learned that I should not depend entirely on Waze because, as I was saying earlier, Waze is usually really, really good at finding the best way to go. However, when it goofs, it can goof very dramatically. For example, on one recent trip, as I was going back south from uh museum visit in, in northern New Jersey, it pointed me in the wrong direction. And I later checked to see, well, maybe it was trying to get me around some traffic jam or something. No, I mean, it was just wrong. And occasionally it is wrong. So somebody who completely drops their judgment and sense of where they are, somebody who doesn't use printed maps entirely, is going to be at risk of one of those uh, periodic failures of ways, which might only be one-tenth of one percent of the time, but that one-tenth of one percent could be costly. Now, the area of medicine, they're starting to use some very targeted approaches using data, body scans, genetic information that is really individual to the person involved. Now, what are the problems with this? Because we've always called it the practice of medicine, not the rigid application of medicine. So where are we headed in this area? As with other applications of advanced technology, there are, there are many, many benefits. So I will be the last to say 
that we that we should not pursue this. Uh, however, there, there's a point that applies not only to medicine but to other applications of big data, and that is we really need bigger data on the use of big data. In other words, well, we 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 should not assume that individual um, uh, sequencing individuals' genomes or or predicting this or that is going to improve health outcomes until we have seen the results of, uh, of carefully constructed studies. I am concerned about different aspects of, um, of the uh, medical use of big data. For example, one of the classic problems in, uh, in medicine and the source of a lot of complications is uh, false positives. So many, many tests for disease will give positives that have to be resolved by other tests, which in turn can lead to complications and, and so forth. So there's, there's, uh, there is no free lunch in, uh, in, in medical information. That, that we, that there is usually a risk uh, connected with using it, which doesn't mean that we, that we shouldn't use it. But I'm convinced by those doctors that say that a, a doctor's knowledge of an individual patient is at least as important as all of the tests and data. For example, it's essential for people to comply with a regimen. A doctor needs to know what is necessary to uh, get someone to uh, follow a course. If, if they're not going to follow it, maybe it would be better to do something else. So there really isn't, to me, a substitute for a, a knowledge of the 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 patient as, as an individual, and one problem with today's medicine is that doctors don't really get uh, enough uh, support, enough uh, recognition for that, but also that uh, doctors now with electronic medicine are actually less efficient in the sense that they have to spend so much more time uh, coding and, and processing things, and they have less time to devote to their patients. We're talking to Dr. Edward Tenner. The book is called The Efficiency Paradox, What Big Data Can't Do. And you say to us, and I found this uh, intriguing, there are many things that even little children can appreciate that the most advanced technologies of machine learning can't. Sounds like everything I needed to know I learned in kindergarten. What are you actually suggesting here? Even before kindergarten, I, I, I'm, uh, one of the things that's intrigued me is how little children are able to understand the meaning of unfamiliar proverbs. Uh, for instance, uh, a stitch in time saves nine. Uh, and there are some that are borderline. For example, I, I still remember as a, as a preschooler uh, hearing about a rolling stone gathering no moss. And that's always been a puzzle to me. Does, is, is moss good or bad? Is, is a rolling stone that gathers no moss a, a smooth and pristine stone and, and thus a more uh, valuable stone? Or is moss good? Is, is moss a metaphor for money and you should not be too mobile if you, if you, want, to, uh, if you want to maximize your income? Uh, so that actually brings up something else, that a lot of human communication is not the kind of logic that you find in computers but is ambiguous, and I'm, I'm speaking this evening at a, uh, at a, at a meeting of uh, Shakespeare enthusiasts, and uh, one of the great things about Shakespeare is how many different ways his plays can be interpreted. We're very lucky that he never set down anything about what he really meant. Uh, so uh, the children's ability to uh, deal with metaphor and ambiguity, to me, is uh, a very encouraging thing and, and something that, that uh, no computer today is really able to come close to. You leave us in the book with some strategies to balance algorithms and common sense. Uh, can you share just some of those with us, and then we will encourage people to actually go and buy the book and to read the rest, but give us a few. Well, one, one of my uh, favorites is the idea of the perfect five. That is that that on one extreme, there are people who believe that intuition alone, uh, seat of the pants, is really good enough. On the other hand, there are the enthusiasts who say we should, we should really uh, go, go all the way and, and turn everything over to, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to, to algorithms and machine learning. It's, it's 
obvious to say that there is a there is a a good balance, and it might vary from some people. It it might be it might be seven to three for some, three to seven for others. But I think of it as a kind of fifty fifty thing, and and something that everybody needs to uh, see in in their in their own right. Uh, I, I think it's also important for people to retain confidence in their own intuition and not let themselves be intimidated by talk of what is inevitable in the future because we've seen how many predictions of the inevitable have uh, have not turned out. At, at one point, it was uh, uh, people were, were talking about, oh, our food will all come in vitamin pills. That was a very, very serious idea uh, a few generations ago. So I'm not closing the book on anything, but, but I think that uh, that the cultivation of intuition as a counterbalance to new techniques, not, not to exclude them, but to complement them, is really the essence of the book. And finally, what strengths of the human mind can never be replaced as you see it? There are some who say that AI can be so effective now learning a specific task, but ultimately it's going to be able to mimic a lot of our intelligences. What will it never be able to replace in your view? I don't think it will ever be able to replace our ability to to generate exciting exciting new ideas, because the, the means by which we do that uh, can never be articulated. What it, it is very, very good at doing is codifying recent experience. But because the environment is always changing, and actually the adoption of artificial intelligence techniques means that the environment will be changing even more, when all of these systems are interacting, uh, actually human intuition will become even more important because the interaction of those systems will in turn have all kinds of unintended effects and only our intuition will give us a, a firm grip on how we should modify the systems. I want to thank you, Dr. Edward Tenner. A fascinating conversation today and one that I'm sure is going to be opening up a lot of minds uh, to those who listen to America Trends. Again, the book is called The Efficiency Paradox, What Big Data Can't Do. And I thank you so much for being with us here on the podcast today. Thanks so much for this opportunity.